Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are live. We are here to uh, have a conversation. Uh, this conversation is Let's Talk Church. This is a series that we have been doing for over a year on various topics. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. We have some amazing speakers with us today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone and they're going to go go ahead and get into our conversation uh so first up we have apostle lionel and jasmine blair I want to thank you both for joining us thank you hello we have uh minister shaniki with us as well and then we'll have uh, minister gordon coming on to join us also okay so our first topic that we're going to go ahead and tackle is discipleship. And I'm going to share a scripture before we get into the conversation. Um, it's one thing that we always want to do because we have some folks that are like, oh, show me the Bible. Okay, we're going to give you the Bible. We're going to give you the Bible. So our um, first scripture that we're going to be talking about that goes with, along with discipleship is coming out of the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and i'm going to go ahead and read that so matthew 28 verse 19 go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Man. Now, yes. Now we got Bible, but I've in um, my time in ministry and in some churches, um, we don't have a lot of discipleship. Mm -hmm. We don't. You know, when I first got um, saved, when I first gave my life back to God, I had to go through a 12 week discipleship class before I even got baptized. And so just, um, you know, years later and going to various churches and talking with various people, a lot of it is not happening nowadays. Mm -hmm. Now, is it a requirement to be mm -hmm. a born again believer to go through discipleship? All right. My question is, how do people know what is, um, what is required of them if they don't have some type of um education on what it is to be a christian how we're supposed to act what you know what's your take on that all right i'll tackle that one um first of all i think um discipleship should be a requirement for every christian um but I think like now we settle for membership instead of mm -hmm. discipleship. Come on. Membership is when I come, I show up, I get my tithes and offer, and I go home. Some of them don't even do that. Um, but when you are a disciple, you walk with in a you you walk with a master teacher. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, um, discipleship requires more of a commitment. Mm -hmm. a commitment to embodying the faith that you have come into uh, yes. some people some people they can believe but they're not totally converted mm -hmm. you know That's so good. you but you you do enough to get in come on you don't do what it takes to embrace the mm -hmm. the culture of the kingdom of god mm -hmm. and See, because he would disciples discipleship is like a chiseling. Mm -hmm. He chisel all that worldliness off of you, all that all that offense off of you, all of that fear off of you, all of the things that would uh, hinder you from really walking the walk. Because a lot of people talk the talk, but they don't walk it. Mm -hmm. You know, they they just around it enough 
to believe in it enough to, you know, some folks say, I'm just glad to be in the number. And I hate that saying mm -hmm. yes. because that means now you're settling. Ooh. You're glad to be in the number, but you're not, but, but you're not actively pursuing um, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the God of the culture first, and then the conformity of the culture. Yes. Because the kingdom has its own culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this is why, this is why we still have, you know, prophets try to be mafia dons <laughs> because you ain't been properly discipled. This is why we, this, this is why we still struggle mm -hmm. with the same stuff we've been struggling with for like five, 10 years. Um, okay. Why, why, yes. why are we still struggling with the same stuff? Mm -hmm. It's okay to come in with it, but if there's no change, mm. that means you need an extra set of eyes over you. See, a lot of people like discipleship because discipleship makes you more accountable. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. When they was when, yes. when when the twelve was discipled by Jesus, when they was discipled by Jesus, they were always corrected about something. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. done in love, but it was it was done. See, discipleship requires you to walk with someone. And mm -hmm. when you walk with someone, it's almost like you're sharing life with them. You're, 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 you're vulnerable. It, it takes a level of vulnerability to be properly discipled. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because see, now you're letting someone in your life. You're letting someone in your life. You're letting someone practically almost in your business telling you like, hey, you know, you may do it this way or view it this way. But there's a more excellent way to do this, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, so we don't make disciples today because a lot of people don't want to be disciples, mm -hmm. and then a lot of people are taught. A, a lot of leaders are not taught that they need to be making disciples. Yes, and then a lot of us we don't commit to these kind of relationships long term mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because as soon as something rub rub us the wrong way, we go. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's my two cents on it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. said a lot. You said a lot. I'm sorry. Apostle That's Johnson, okay. you want to say something? Yes, I definitely want to add to that. I want to touch on what you mentioned about mm -hmm. the commitment piece. Um, because we were having this conversation the other day. But to answer your question, yes, discipleship should absolutely be required. I believe a lot of leaders are not taught the need for them to continue to make disciples, that it is a biblical commandment, we should definitely be making disciples. A lot of people have what I call the copycat model. You know, whoever raised them in ministry, if you will, mm -hmm. they go on to do ministry the way that they did ministry. Right. And then whoever they raise go on to do ministry that way. And if we keep, if you take a piece of paper and run it through a copy machine and you keep copying the copy, uh -huh. eventually it's going to be blurred. It's not going to look anything Ooh. like the original. Come on. And somebody has to be brave enough to say, I honor pastor so-and-so, I honor bishop so-and-so, but I'm going back to study to make sure I'm in line with the biblical mm -hmm. copy, not what they did. Not that it's wrong. God bless them. They did the best that they knew how, but I can honor them and still go back and make sure I'm following what's in the word. Right. So that alone is why we don't see a lot of stuff that we should see because we're going off of whoever raised us and what they taught us and not going back to study for ourselves. That's right. Now, with discipleship today, commitment is a very big thing. We were just having yeah. this conversation privately the other day. Between the last three, four generations, we've gone from people who have not missed a Sunday of church since 1975 to people now who think they're doing good if they show up to church twice a month. Yeah. <laughs> so when you tell somebody with that mindset, okay, I need you to commit to this class for 12 weeks, three months, six months, nine months. I know we spaced discipleship out over a nine month period. What? I got a pl I got plans. I got life. I got to do this. I got to do that. that so that part, part of the lack of discipleship is people wanting to commit. That commitment, you know, because we have seen, you know, a lot of different interesting things in church. And while people have legitimate horror stories, there's a commitment issue I know specifically with the most recent generations, they don't want to put the time in or the effort in. Okay, I'm here, I'm gifted, put me on a platform. Right. But it's literally a process of time. 
when you walk with a master teacher as a disciple, you are a student. So you mm -hmm. are in a place to learn. You are in a place to be trained, groomed, if you will. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people don't like that word, but Think about when you become an apprentice of, let's say, a carpenter. They've got to teach you not just how to make a table, how to fix one that's wobbly, how to level it. There's a lot of different processes, and it's on hands-on training that requires critiquing and correcting as you go along. And if we value commitment and we value people's souls the way that we say that we do mm -hmm. as a body, Come then on. we will honor discipleship because the last thing we want to do is start commissioning people in ministry that's going to tear somebody up and cause church hurt because they just didn't know no better because they were mm -hmm. not properly discipled. But a lot of that comes in that apprentice phase. I'd rather have a disciple prophesy something that might be, uh, but still under the guidance of a master teacher, okay, we can still bring this back center so that this person's soul is not wounded. Mm -hmm. And for you to, okay, well, I'm gifted and just go out there and now we're wounding people. So mm -hmm. even in this epidemic, I'll say of church hurt, part of it comes from the lack of discipleship and bad mm -hmm. fathering and mothering in the Lord. When we start repairing the breaches in that area, yes. we're going to see a lot more discipleship. And I even believe prophetic and ministry and personal ministry is going to be a lot more in the excellence of Jesus Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. My God. Definitely. Woo. That was powerful. <laughs> Amen. My God. That was powerful. Oh my goodness. Look, I'm over here taking my notes now, y'all. <laughs> you know, we talk about discipleship. I got to agree with what you both were saying. Um, church now is set up just for membership. How many members can I get? Come how, on. You know, right. how many more members can I get in Come my on. church? You know, I'm mm -hmm. trying to get these tithes and offerings up. So how many more members that we don't care mm -hmm. about if someone is learning? We don't care about this. So we say we do, but we don't care about their soul. We want to see how we can grow that membership. But we got people yes. here who's suffering. We got people over here who's who, who need something, who's coming to church yes. searching for something. But Come we're on. so concerned about getting that membership up that, you know, we don't even focus on discipleship. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's, it, is, it is a commandment in the Bible you know, that we are to make disciples. And yes. we don't have those. We don't offer those, those teachings. We don't offer those courses. So I like the fact, um, Mr. Dr. Tamara, when you were talking about the 12 week course, we need things like that. Yes, yes. We need things like that. You know, somebody want to get baptized. Okay, we're going to baptize you next month. Okay, but what are we teaching them? That we're just baptizing folks to get our membership up. But we got to <laughs> no. be teaching them. We got to be yeah. teaching. And it starts with, like you said, that course. I love that idea of a 12-week course. But again, mm -hmm. people don't want to commit, but they commit to what they want to. They oh, commit God. to unnecessary stuff. Oh, they commit to it. stuff that has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with growing, nothing to do with, you know, making this. We ought to make the, become disciples so we can make more disciples. Yes. So we got to be able, we as, as leaders, it starts with the leadership and goes down. And so I agree with everything that was said and, uh, you know, our churches are set up for membership. How many more members can I get? Because I'm trying to get, you know, I want to get my tithes and offerings up. You know, I want to get, you know, so-and-so church got these many members. I'm trying to get up there to that status. No, mm -hmm. come on, let's deal with the people that we already have in church. What are they in need of? What are they seeking? What are they searching for? Where are they lost? What's going on? Let's get that up. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, this, this is, I, I love this, this topic about discipleship because we don't do enough. Yeah. nowadays in church I don't know. okay christopher you want to take a tackle at it <laughs> well uh good good afternoon <laughs> good afternoon blessings uh thank you um i i don't want to just I, i've been listening to the to the conversation going forth but what was the initial question i don't want to just start for sure so are, is it a requirement? Should we be doing it? Why aren't we doing it? Just discipleship. And I gave the scripture of Matthew 28, 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on that question of discipleship and from the conversation that has been already brewing up, uh, it, it ought to be a requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just start off by saying, I'm, I'm really disappointed in the state of mm -hmm. church currently. And it's a disappointment, not just with the membership, but with the leaders as well. 
Um, I'm going to assume that we're all in positions of leadership of some sort of capacity. Mm-hmm. So I kind of usually hold my, uh, I guess you say my vitriol toward leaders. And it's, it's a disappointment. Uh, I was speaking about that this morning. A uh, pastor friend of mine, his church put out some statement. And I was just like, nah, uh-uh. And so I was mm-hmm. talking to a few other uh, friends of mine. We were going back and forth. And uh, he, he took us back to uh, Revelation and was talking about how the different churches that existed in Revelation, how, uh, how Jesus gets on all of them except one, on how they dealt with the world and how they kind of, in a real sense, acquiesced to the world to the world structures and everything. And there was one church, uh, most of the churches compromised. And uh, there was one church that was very consistent. And there's only one church in Revelation that he kind of upholds and tells them to keep on going. And uh, what I see, if if that's true, then only one church out of, let's say one out of four is actually kind of staying the course, doing the things as they supposed to be. Then we, then I could say this, three out of four churches, 75% of them are very much so uh, compromised. Mm-hmm. And so we're in a state of today where uh, I'm assuming we all black too, black churches. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> well, the black church is, is in a state of uh, mm-hmm. identity crisis. Mm, you got that right. Where we're trying to search for our place in the world and, and and at the same time a lot of people are kind of vying for our I guess for our support and to get the black church involved with a particular agenda whether left or right mm-hmm. and, I'm, and I'm, I'm really disappointed uh not and here's how it all comes down to discipleship as well we've tried to remove everything that inconvenienced believers Mm-hmm. out of the way to make church so seeker sensitive so comfortable and because mm-hmm. it's become so comfortable that we produced a casual christian mm-hmm. if for a person a day to say that they're christian don't really mean nothing right you can't tell the difference between them and some other black person that just mention god every now and then and it, it means nothing. We've got so many casual Christians running around mm-hmm. and 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 I know it because of the stuff people say online, the stuff mm-hmm. people post and all this stuff. And, and at one point, there was at least a line where you say, okay, if I'm going to be a part of the church, then I can't say this and I can't yes. do it publicly. That mm-hmm. line has been erased <laughs> uh, because you can do anything you want to do. Oh, come on. Live how you want to live and still incite Jeremiah 29, 11, because God knows the plans and he's there. <laughs> and that's how, that's how low we really lowered the bar for our faith. So um, but we're not, so needless to say, discipleship has been out the window mm-hmm. because people are undiscipled, untrained, not even under any covering. And I get on millennials a lot, but thank God, because I was probably one of the worst ones, but uh, one of the things that, that I have a hard time doing with millennials is trying to convince millennial Christians, millennial Christians, why they need to go to church. Mm-hmm. And if I have to spend much time dealing with unchurched folk and the unchurched that I have to deal with are Christians, then that shows something is wrong with and I, and I hold discipleship method. We drop the ball across the board. I mean, and I start with leaders. I blame leaders for producing this comfortable Christianity Mm -hmm. that produced these casual Christians everywhere. Wow. Mm -hmm. Agree. I so agree. I had a conversation with a leader um, probably a year or so ago. um, And I asked him, you know, like, do you have discipleship classes at your church? No. And I was like, why not? Oh, it's that, you know, just... It's, it's not that's not what our church is about I'm like but it's in the bible I'm like wow don't you have it it's like you know and I offered I said well I know you're short stuff I said I will come in and teach it for you I'll buy the curriculum 
you know it's like this it, it's needed like your people need it you know because i i um knew the people i've been to the church i'm like they they need this i'm like they d- just you coming in on sundays and preaching to them and i'm um you know bible study half of them don't show up i said they need this oh that's you know no every church is not the same and i'm like I didn't see in the Bible where it broke down like, oh, this church should do discipleship and this church should do it. It's like all of us should be doing it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what we're dealing with. <laughs> and that's what we're dealing with. Okay, so let's move on to the fivefold ministry. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I'm going to give scripture again because unfortunately everyone doesn't read their bible so we want everybody to know what we're talking about uh so i'm going to be reading ephesians 4 11 through 16 and it says and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine Mm -hmm. by the trickery of men and the cutting craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we're tying the fivefold ministry into um, God designed leadership. Now just notice, I didn't say mothers. I didn't say the board of directors. I didn't say <laughs> the, the people in the pews is apostles, prophets, pastors, <laughs> teachers, and evangelists. So let's go ahead and dive on in. Okay, so fivefold ministry, God designed leadership. Mm. We have, um, you know, God's model and then we have man's model because right right now it's just like the pastor is the only one that's in control. The pastor is the only one who can uh, speak to the sheep. The pastor is the only one that um, can... um, what's the word can lead the church the pastor is the all and everything so right. from right. what we just heard in the scripture let's is that it is that is it supposed to be the pastor did god at any time say okay i'm taking away everything else and i'm just putting everything on the pastor right um i will say this um uh the fivefold ministry is a loaded it's a very, very, very loaded subject, mm-hmm. but um, I will, I will say this. Um, even the scripture you mentioned earlier, um, where where, where it talks about discipleship, mm-hmm. we got to realize who Jesus first gave the commandments to. Yes, who he gave the first commission uh, of the great commission to. The great mm-hmm. commission is first and foremost an apostolic commission. He gave it to the apostles first. Mm-hmm. But then but then I believe these guys begin to realize like this is a whole lot just mm-hmm. for us to do alone. Yes. So 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 being that the church was entrusted to the apostles, they begin to get the revelation like you know what? We need other we need other uh ministry gifts in place to assist us with um completing this commission. Because mm-hmm. one office can't do it all. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then I, I believe this is why he began to put the prophets in place, the the the, the teachers and the evangelists um, and the pastors in place, because one office can't do it all. And this mm-hmm. is why I don't believe this this doctrine where the apostle is the all five ministry uh, gifts. I, I don't find that in the Bible. Now, some people teach it. Some people I know teach it. I don't agree with that. Um, so first and foremost, it is an apostolic um, commission. Um, and then, you know, uh, also we need to realize, too, that there is no scripture that we see where the pastor is the senior leader of the church. Hmm. I don't find it. I don't find it nowhere in the script. hmm. So, so, so it also makes you wonder because there's a pressure that comes with certain seats. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And now and you wonder why pastors are quitting. You wonder why pastors are committing suicide because you're not graced for the warfare of that seat. Mm. You know, and, 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 and I'm not belittling or downing pastors. We need pastors in their proper place. Yes. Pastors are always among the sheep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Taking care of the needs of the sheep, you know, uh, 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 but but a lot of times the pastors cannot take care of the needs of the sheep because they're too busy trying to make the make the governmental decisions in the direction of the overall operation of everything. Wow, it's taken away from the grace. So 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 I believe that all five serve a purpose. We need evangelists. Yes. Okay. Where where did, where did the evangelists go? We got too many evangelists trying to be prophets and apostles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just because you can prophesy don't mean you are a prophet. Okay. Mm-hmm. If I hear you always talking about we need to win souls, baby, you an evangelist. <laughs> okay. If, if if you always talking about outreach, that is evangelism. Mm-hmm. You always see, 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 evangelists are good at outreach. Shepherds are good at inreach. Mm-hmm. That's good. Shepherds inreach, evangelists mm-hmm. outreach. That's a major difference. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, so 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 I, I hear people all the time. Oh, we oh we need to win souls. You talk about winning souls more than you talk about order government. You're not an apostle. You're an evangelist. You know, apostles are very passionate about government order because see when when you bring people in, you need to bring them into the right thing. Yes, bring them into the right thing, the right structure. You need to make sure that everything that we're doing, we're agreeing with God. Mm-hmm. And I'm giving I'm giving very shallow explanations about the fivefold ministry because I can I can really go deep, but time mm-hmm. will not time will not permit me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> permit, but I, I, got, I got to, I got to, I got to go shallow with you on here. You know, we got paid <laughs> courses for stuff like this. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, but 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 the apostle maintains the government and the and, and the structure and the integrity of the church. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's their grace. You know, mm-hmm. that they, they, they say the fivefold ministry is like yeah, like 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 the fingers on the hand. You know, they mm-hmm. say the apostle touched all the, the rest of the four. The apostle is not the rest of them, he touched the rest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but then he said the 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 the, the pointing finger. They compare that to the prophet. Why? Because the prophet gives direction to the church. Yes. The prophet, the pro, the the apostle sees it, and the and the prophet tells you how to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we don't we don't we don't know the will of God. We don't know what God is saying, or or we don't know what God is doing. Because surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His, his secrets to His servants, the prophets. Yes. Okay. Uh, we we think because somebody is a good prophesier that they are a prophet. Okay, but there's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, 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 the prophet is an office, is a post. Okay, it is, it is, it is, it is an official office and position in 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 the government of the kingdom of God in the church. Yes. You know, uh, 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 so 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 certain things a prophet is privy to that 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 everybody else is not. Mm-hmm. Oh. You, you know, and then we need teachers. We need people. Too many illiterate believers. We need teachers. We we I I, I you know I I don't see nobody trying to be in the office of a teacher. Mm-hmm. All we see is a prophet so and so, apostle so and so. I don't see teachers so and so nowhere. That's true. Where are the teachers? We 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 need the teachers. We do. That's mm-hmm. good. And I, I want to add to that. First Corinthians 12 and 28 says, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, yes. helps governments, diversity of tongues. So mm-hmm. we see that with God, what God has set in the church, we see apostles, prophets, and teachers. These make up the foundation of the government within the church. Certainly, we know that pastors have a place. We need pastors. Pastors tend to the sheep. They feed the sheep. They look out for the sheep. They protect the sheep. They help clean and doctor their wounds, so to speak. But their place is among the sheep. And as was said before, I believe when we shift the dynamics 
of church and we have pastors shifting to their rightful place, mm-hmm. doesn't mean that that pastor will not raise up to be an apostle or a prophet later on if that's their call. But when we have pastors in their rightful place, I believe we will start to see more growth and more effectiveness in the body as a whole. Yes. Some um, senior pastors, I believe they're, they're pastors, you know, depending upon their denomination or how they were raised up. Because as I said earlier, a lot of things are perpetuated when you have somebody doing ministry the way somebody raised them in ministry, because that's what they know. That's what they've been exposed to. Yeah. Some senior pastors, I believe, are actually apostles and prophets and teachers. And if they answer that and shift, we'll see a shift there. And But to be honest, some people can't, depending upon their denomination and what they're a part of. Hmm. Them shifting to where they should be would mean them getting the left foot of fellowship for some <laughs> people, unfortunately. <laughs> but there's something else that I want to go back to when you were reading in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, I believe it was, there, there's a verse here in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith That's and it. of the knowledge of the son of God to yeah. a perfect man, to, watch this, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Fullness of Christ. Now, I hear this passage read so much, but to me, this is one of my favorite verses because it points out the purpose. So much, I believe in the body, we argue so much about the fivefold, who should be where, is there Mm -hmm. a hierarchy, is it lateral, is it, how is it, that we miss the actual purpose. We say, oh, we're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, but why? And verse 13 elaborates on that answer. Though Jesus Christ is the son of God, he came down in the form of man. So we are God, Jesus has left us the fivefold ministry to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So we all come in the knowledge of the faith of the son of God as a perfect man. The fivefold is supposed to mature us to the same status of maturity that Jesus Christ had when he was on the earth. He knew one person couldn't do it. He knew one office couldn't do it. So when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. And if we understand everybody's grace as the fivefold, we understand collectively we have a responsibility by Jesus Christ, the head of the church, to mature every believer to be just as mature as he was while he was on the earth. And if we can't work together as a body cooperatively to bring this to pass, it doesn't matter what your office is. We are Mm -hmm. failing our original mandate and commission. Yes. My God. My God. That's, oh, my God. You touched on them, that first 13. That's the key word I saw is unity. I always speak yes. about unity. Yes. If we we all have a gift. And if we all walk in our gift, if we all do what we're supposed to do it with our yes. gift and come together and have the mind that we are here for one purpose only, if we all can do that, the church can, can be better. It could be yes. better, but you know, we don't, we so afraid somebody gonna get more than us or somebody gonna mm-hmm. get a certain um, position. And you know, and so, and I, I, Pastor, I thank you for breaking down what each of these mean because uh, you don't hear a lot about the fivefold ministry. A lot of people leave out the apostle and the prophets and the evangelists, and all you really hear about is Pat. And I know from where I'm at, yes. you hear about pastors and teachers, and you know they don't want to talk about the overall fivefold ministry. They don't want to talk about apostles and prophets, and pro- especially prophets. They it, it's out the question. Prophets, you know, they don't want to talk about that. But I thank you for breaking that down. And, you know, I was, when you was talking, I was, you know, I was like, you need to teach a class on this because, you know, it's, it's really good information yes. and it's not talked about. And I, and I said that because where I'm from, I'm from a, just a little country, mm-hmm. you know, I, I grew up in a little country church and, you know, we don't hear about this where I'm from. We don't talk enough about this. So that's mm-hmm. why I'm so glad Dr. Wow. Tamara opened up this platform wow. because Amen. I'm learning so Amen. many different things. Um, because I don't hear a lot about these things, but I know that it's there as I'm reading the Bible and I'm knowing what God is saying. And, you know, and again, we talked about the um, unity coming mm-hmm. together. We all have a gift, whatever the gift is, we all have it. But when we come together, we too busy fighting. We too busy, jealous of one another. We too busy mm-hmm. worried about who's doing this and who's doing that. But when they unity, when we unify and come together, my God, mm-hmm. my God, the church can prosper. People can grow. We can make disciples because we're all doing what we're supposed to do. Yes. Mm. yes. Oh, yes. And it's um, another, I had another conversation with another leader. 
a lot of leaders, pastors, they do not believe in apostles and prophets, mm -hmm. even though it's in the Bible. Mm. Yeah, well, they, 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 they must not, they must not read their Bible then, because the Bible was written by apostles and prophets. Mm -hmm. So if you don't believe in apostles and prophets, then you might well throw the Bible away. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. Where do you get that your doctrine right from? And, and, and surely the Lord is not going to establish something, especially in the New Testament, mm -hmm. and it not still be relevant today. Come on, man, that's true. You know, you know, I, I, you know, you know, the prophets transcend from 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 the Old Testament, Old Covenant to the New Covenant. So, so surely there are prophets today, and it, and 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 he commissioned the apostles to start and govern the church. Mm -hmm. So that tells me apostles and prophets are still relevant today to mm -hmm. say that th there's not one scripture that says, I don't care. I don't care what they did throughout history. Mm -hmm. There is not one scripture that says that the apostles and the prophets are done away with today. That's mm -hmm. true. It's error. It's error. And see, you notice even throughout history, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, studying church history, you learn a lot of rich things. Mm -hmm. But when 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 they begin to take away the apostles, <laughs> we begin to see a decline in power. That's true. Come on. Well, where, where, where are the miracles today? Mm. You know, you know, only a handful of people are really flowing in miracles on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. That miracle dimension that hit the early church first started with the apostles and it hit. And, and, and it hit the rest of the fivefold and the believers. Mm -hmm. But it started with the apostles. You understand? So, so and, and, and we're not going to even talk about the prophets. Hmm. You know, the, 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 <laughs> those, those old covenant miracles. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, so, so if, if people say that there are no more apostles and prophets today, they probably don't have no miracles in their ministry. Come on here. Mm. You probably don't. No. I mean, they, 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 you, you may get a little prophecy, a little hook of Messiah every now and then, but <laughs> there's no tangible miracles. <laughs> there's no tangible miracles. And, and if anybody tell you that they're an apostle and they don't form miracles, they're false apostles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Can't even heal a headache. What, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll let, 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 me, let me be calm. Be calm. <laughs> I'm gonna touch on that later in the conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm calm because it's not my platform. Uh, but <laughs> but e e even with the prophetic, we got to raise the standard for the prophetic too. Absolutely. It, it, you, you can't just be a good little prophesier. I mean, there has to be some supernatural element behind your ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and again, I think that you know, not only we need to defend these offices, we need to raise the bar for them. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Because it's too easy now for people to say, I'm an apostle. I haven't seen so many yeah. apostles with no miracles mm -hmm. in my life. <laughs> I haven't seen so many apostles. And, and, and you know, listen, I started off ministry young, but they're getting younger and younger with no power. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Come on. You know, you know I'm, I'm not that old. I'm mm. not that old, you know. Uh, but but at least I had the fruit and I had the signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've seen many miracles over the years. My God. Okay, and it's by God's grace. But certain things just come with the office. Yes. yes. Even if you may not start off with it per se, but you grow up into it, you should at least have it. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You know, I think we need to get back to the power of God too. Jesus, come on. Mm -hmm. First of, first of all, the Bible mm. says even an evangelist is supposed to move in healings and miracles. Come on, yeah. Come on. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, okay, preaching on the street corners, okay, that you, you call it evangelism with no power? <laughs> no power? My you know, my, my, my God, can you heal a headache or something? Can, <laughs> you, can you give a little word of knowledge? Can you flow in the gifts of the spirit or something? You know, uh, 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 we we talk a lot about the charismatics, but they 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 move it in the power. Come on, you know what are we doing, especially in the black church, having church? <laughs> talk about talk about this. There's no more apostles today. 
okay, and, 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 and you have sick, talking about there no more apostles. Maybe you need an apostle to come to your church and lay hands on you. <laughs> oh, Lord, yes, yes. I'm They're just saying. That, right. that, 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 You're right. That triggered something when you said that. Now that triggered something with me. <laughs> <laughs> that triggered something because I've been Come defending apostles and prophets for years. Come Matter of fact, the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church. Jesus. Come on. Come on. Without without apostles and prophets, you won't have no church. Come on. So if the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church, and you don't have apostles and prophets in or connected to your church, what do you really have? Why are you having church? Because Jesus is the chief cornerstone. That's it. And extended mm. from that cornerstone is the foundation of apostles and prophets for the church. I got it. And I because we have failed about. to accurately define mm -hmm. the role of apostles and prophets, mm -hmm. now we got people, now we got novices hijacking the office. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, of course, that causes a ripple effect of more damage because now these guys trying to be fathers. Mm -hmm. These people mm -hmm. try to be fathers and mothers to people without being properly vetted and raised up in the office themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is why we need to go back to basics. Yes, um, yes, yes. And we need to revisit our foundation again, which we don't have without apostles and prophets. That's it. Mm -hmm. You say pastors. Uh -uh. <laughs> God bless them. I honor pastors. Yes. I honor pastors, but they're not the foundation of the church. There's nowhere in scripture where a pastor founded a church. No. I don't uh -uh. see it. No. I don't see it. Uh -uh. You know, you know, on one hand, we don't have enough of uh, properly founded ministries. And then on the other hand, we got too many of them. Yes. <laughs> we just need a whole reform altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Because, see, God moves on the right structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. He moves on the right order. And I'm not right. trying to, you know, you know, beat nobody down or anything. We just need to get back to the right order of things. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I believe in the fivefold ministry, but everything starts with the apostle and the prophet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything. Now, the other thing that is interesting in this dynamic with the fivefold ministry is there are people on the other extreme. You have people that are so apostolic and prophetic in nature in their ministry. There's no room for pastors there. Right. <laughs> Everything is apostolic and prophetic. And some of the things, that, and I don't want to use the word normal subjectively, but what you would expect in a church, you don't really see. So mm. we have churches that are wild because they're apostolic and prophetic, but they lack the structure that the average person would want to see or expect to see in a ministry. And I find that ministries that are structured like that are in a place where if these people would be in anybody else's church, they would not be qualified. Mm. So I find that a lot of people who do not quote unquote make the cut in going through a discipleship class, going through a ministers in training class, being developed and being processed before elevated, they just go somewhere and start their own church or they go somewhere and get a few prophecies that, oh, you're called to be a pastor or a prophet or an apostle evangelist or what have you. And then they gather this group of people that have confirmed them prophetically. And then these are the people that affirm them into office. And it mm -hmm. has become a mess. And one thing that we have to look for, if this person would not cut it in somebody's church as an elder, they have no business being anybody's apostle or prophet. Mm -hmm. Because the test of readiness that the, the Bible gives, you know, being a husband of one wife or a wife of one husband, having your fam family together, having your kids submitted, having your character in order. Nobody is so apostolic and prophetic that that doesn't apply to them anymore. Come on now. But we go, well, I don't do all that. I don't do church. I do fivefold ministry is what a lot of the millennials are saying. Now, I don't, I'm not with all that. I'm with the fivefold ministry. But oh, but where do does that give you a place to remove the test of character? Come on, yeah. No matter what our office is, no matter what we call to, no matter what structure we're in or restructuring, these things apply to everybody. 
And if we could grab that as the body and stand in agreement with that, a lot of this clutter would be cleared up. Mm. because we cannot say well they they were trying to stop my ministry they they wanted me to go through this training and and i know i'm called to be a prophet but you mm. should have character mm. you you should only have be committed to one person hello you should have your family together you shouldn't be given over to much wine you should be somebody of a reputable moral character yes. so but this ties back into the original question of discipleship when we get discipleship right, that is the birthplace of a lot of this dysfunction, the lack of discipleship, right. and we desperately need discipleship. That's right. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we got a question in the chat. Um, before I jump to the question, Christopher, did you want to say anything? You good? <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> Okay, so we have a question. Someone, um, Pastor Damon, he wants um, you to break down what an apostle is. Mm. Okay. Ooh, that's loaded. Yes. <laughs> that, is, that is loaded because when, 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 when I break down what an apostle is, you got to go back to the ancient origins. Yes. Um, the Greek word for apostle is apostolos. Now, mm. this word, See, I teach this in a class. This, this, uh, this word is applicable to when um, either the Caesar or the Roman Senate would choose an individual, right? Give him a commission of conquering territory. Hmm. Conquering territory, right? Mm -hmm. And he would say, hey, go to this to go to, to, to this distant land and claim that territory for me. Mm -hmm. And then when he was sent, he was sent with the resources to start a whole new colony. So so in essence, what this apostolos was was an admiral, a general by land and an admiral by sea. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would go into a territory and they would conquer and take over. You know, <laughs> I remember an old movie that I watched years ago. He said, get down or lay down. <laughs> they will come with the threat of military might. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't get down, they was going to lay you down and recolonize your entire city or nation. Mm -hmm. They did it for, for cities or nations. So, so this is how the ancient world understood apostolos, which where we get the word apostle today. Now, in the kingdom of God, what what essentially what what an apostle is is God's colonizers. Hmm. Okay, they 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 we are colonizers for the kingdom. In other words, wherever we're set up, we're called to reculture everyone, mm -hmm. bring everyone into the culture and the understanding of the kingdom, and also with that we have an ambassadorial assignment. When Paul said we are ambassadors. He won't talk about every believer. He was talking about himself and the apostles that was mm -hmm. on his team that accompanied him because we really study the responsibility of an ambassador. Okay. The responsibility. See, 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 all of us, we represent the Lord, but everybody don't represent the Lord on an ambassadorial level because with that comes with an office and a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so Paul said, what, we are ambassadors and we endure you in Christ instead. Be ye reconciled to God, right? Be mm -hmm. reconciled to God. He said, what, we endure you in Christ instead. In other words, in other words, an apostle is one who, who, who stands in the stead of God saying, be reconciled to God. Just like the Bible says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, same concept, mm -hmm. right? And, and reconcile means to come into agreement with God. Yes. Okay. Come, not God come into agreement with you. <laughs> this is why the, you come into agreement with God. This is why, this is why apostles come with such a governmental uh, a, a message because we're called 
to colonize and to convert people to God's way of doing things. Yes. We're called to make sure that you agree with God. So, so, so wherever an ambassador is, that's where the embassy is. Mm -hmm. Ah, see, I've got too much time to get to. I, I've got too much time to get into that because because it's way deeper. Mm -hmm. It's way deeper. So, so an apostle is one who God sets and, and, and see this. This way, our local churches should be embassies. Yes, embassies. But see, we we and we we have made them into houses of faith only household of faith only when really they're also supposed to be embassies mm -hmm. and where the wherever the embassy is that's where the kingdom is you understand apostles spearhead all of that they they they, they they're entrusted with making sure that 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 the embassy properly represents the kingdom and the embassy is a place of safety for the citizens of the kingdom and whatever region that they're set up. So, 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 and, 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 and I know some of y'all probably never heard this before because you just say apostles are just church planters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apostles are the entire four, yeah. five, five fold ministry. We just plant churches. No, it's first and foremost a governmental office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, we've, we've made the apostleship ecclesiastical only. But the ancient world understood that if somebody said there was an apostle, there was an ambassador or a general, okay, sent with, uh, uh, see, that's why the apostles called the sent one. Mm -hmm. Apostolos means to be sent. But see, you, you it, it's not just someone who just go, goes and, and just sent from one place to another. No, you're sent on a mission with orders, specific orders, okay, from an emperor, specific orders from a, uh, 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 an, an emperor or senate or something, okay, to conquer and to colonize. Mm. Now, basically, just spiritualize everything I just said, and you get the you get the basic role of an apostle, the basic role, and that's and that's foundational. What I just taught, but a lot of people never even heard that. Mm -hmm. That's basic foundational. Amen. And you'll be surprised that most apostles don't even understand what, what, what I just said. Wow. Wow. I hope I clear. I hope I clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that means that even the apostolic structure and the apostolic move needs a reform. Yes. Because a lot of people who say they're apostles, they don't even understand their role. Mm -hmm. I digress. That's good. No, no, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. See, this is how we train apostles. Come we train on. apostles in their understanding in their role. This is why God gives the God attaches the miracles to the office because of the mission in the assignment. Hmm. God, God ain't trying to give you power just so you can put on a magic show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the miracles have purpose. <laughs> the miracles have purpose. That's right. Yes. The authority and the government have purpose. It ain't just for you just to throw your little weight around and have a short man complex like uh like you Napoleon or somebody. Because people who have short man complexes, they abuse power. Mm -hmm. God don't give they power do. to people like that. Mm -hmm. This thing is about advancing the kingdom of God in every, and this is the heart of every apostle, every true apostle to advance the kingdom of God, to do their part to advance the kingdom of God into every system of society. Go ye and preach to, go go ye and preach the gospel to every creature, all yes. creation. Yes. Go ye into all the world, mm. all the world, and preach the gospel. Not stay ye in all the church. The church is where it starts, but we extend. That's why the Bible says the mountain of the Lord's house shall be chief of all the mountains. That's the job of the apostle to make sure that, 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 that the mountain of the Lord's house is established above everything and everyone. Because mm. Jesus is head, head over all things to who? The church. That's what the Bible say. See, that's the passion of apostleship, to see that happen in their sphere mm -hmm. in which they've been given um, an assignment and governance over. 
Who y'all quiet? That's good. No, 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 we we learning. <laughs> okay. We're teaching. <laughs> yes. I got another question. Um, okay. We probably already touched on this, but I'm going to go ahead and um, ask a question. Uh, so it's from Pastor Damon also. So he says, if all of the fivefold members are in one church, who is the main leader? Hmm. <laughs> you want to answer or you want me to answer? You, you can start. I'll answer. Okay. Um, the Bible says, and you just quoted the scripture too, sweetheart. Yes, I, I can go back to yeah, it. First Corinthians 12, 11 says. First God, Corinthians 12, 28. Yeah. God has set some in the church. For, God has set in the church. Not man, mm -hmm. God, it says. <laughs> First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps governments, diversities of tongues. So, so the apostle is the first officer in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. The apostle, if, 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 if you got all five officers in there, then guess what? The apostles are the first. The apostles are the first. Yes, sir. And if you got a, and if you got like a Jerusalem church where you have more than one apostle, then there, there, there's, there will always be a chief apostle in the midst. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. So we're gonna go on to the next um, topic, and it is dealing with offense and discord. And I have oh. two scriptures. I'm going to read first out of Matthew 5, 23, 24. And it says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Okay. And I'm going to Matthew 18. Mm-hmm. 15, 18, 15. And it says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Hmm. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church but if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector mm -hmm. but shortly i say to you whatever you wait no i went too far wait no okay i'm sorry but shortly i say to you whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven yep. and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, mm -hmm. it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, we're dealing with offense and discord. And I'm just going to share a just a brief story just to get us kicked off okay. um, on this subject. So a um, few years ago, um, someone in the church that I was at at the time, they mm -hmm. got offended by something that I said. Wasn't nothing major. Lost a family member. Didn't want to, um, wasn't really in the mindset to be uh, where I was at. Let the people know, you know, this is what I'm dealing with. Really not up for this, but I'm here because right. I made the, I, you know, I said I was going to be here. So I'm going to keep my word. They went back and told their pastor, like, oh, I was offended by what she said. Hmm. Then it comes to, you know, say, you know, I'm sorry for your, the passing of your family member. Didn't give me a hug. Then it say, you know what, let's, let me know what you need help with. They took it to their pastor and said, you know, I was offended by this. And I said, you know, what? I didn't mean to offend anybody. I said, let me have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. No, you don't go talk to my people. You know, that, that mm -hmm. you just need to do right next time. Don't say anything like that next time. And I said, well, the Bible says this is what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And still years later, it's like there was, you know, Pete, that the um, issue just, just kept on. It's like every single time, you know, I said something that they got offended by it, just a continual thing. And I'm like, if we could have nipped this in the bud the first time and had a conversation, it wouldn't have kept going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
let's just dive in. You know, we heard what the, what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Okay. How are we to deal with those things? Okay. Should, you know, we, I believe we should have a conversation, but let's go ahead and talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely want to discuss that before I get into the scenario, a couple things I want to talk about foundationally, because I think accurate understanding and accurate definition is key in all of these situations. Um, we all have either been offended or offended somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time I taught a Bible study on offensive behavior because we have to recognize while we're not responsible for people getting offended, sometimes we can do things that are offensive and not realize it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's, there's an awareness that comes with people in ministry. While we don't want to walk on eggshells for fear of making somebody upset, at the mm -hmm. same time, there's a responsibility that comes with our behavior. Um, so with discord and offense, these are two important things that are tied together, but they're still very different. Discord deals with the disagreement between people while offense more so deals with an annoyance by something that is perceived. And I want to highlight the word perceived because mm -hmm. it is something that they think or feel or in their mind, it's assumption. Assumption is the foundation of offense. A lot of time we will hear something, we'll see something, we'll look at it a certain way and go, well, huh, I wonder why, and going back to your example, well, I wonder why she just don't feel like being here. You know, we supposed to praise God anyhow. Ain't that what the word said? Uh. Well, maybe seem like to me, she got an issue with her faith. So it, it is perceived a certain way and it's assumed. And then that's <laughs> where the birthplace of offense is. So discord, a disagreement between people is a us problem. Offense is a you problem based mm. on what you've assumed or perceived. So Ooh. when we understand what we're dealing with, that first gives us a place to decide what's supposed to happen and how we're supposed to deal with it. A disagreement, a conversation should definitely happen. And whatever the result is, truthfully depends on what the disagreement is. Mm -hmm. One thing that I have found with people in the body of Christ, I found this with all people, but based on this talk in the body of Christ, you have a lot of people in the body of Christ that cannot handle that another Christian can disagree with them. Depending Come upon on the here. subject, that's not a sin. <laughs> if you like Coca-Cola and I like Pepsi and I think Pepsi's better, we don't have to agree. We can be, in, and see, we love to truthfully be offended, but then we quote scripture out of place, well, how can two walk together lest they agree? Well, it depends on the context of the disagreement. Mm -hmm. You can have your Coca-Cola, I can have my Pepsi, and we can still go out to lunch and fellowship, and there doesn't have to be anything that changes. And I find that many people are definitive when it comes to futile or petty disagreements. We want somebody to be right and somebody to be wrong. And depending on the context, that's just unnecessary. A lot of people have fallen out with very good people. Truthfully, I believe destiny changing relationships because we want somebody to agree with us so bad and whatever was not healed in discipleship, whatever deliverance that we did not go through, we go through life with an unhealthy perspective that everybody's supposed to agree with me. And if they don't agree yeah. with me on everything, then we can't walk together because we disagree. Quoting scripture out of context because of a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a conversation. If it's something that's not a heaven or hell issue, hey, you feel that way about it. I feel that way about it. There are other pastors that we are friends with in the fellowship and we don't always agree on the interpretation of the word in certain things, but you know what? We agree on the important things. Jesus right. is Lord, and we've got a work to do to expand the kingdom and bring souls in and to help minister to these people until they mature and they can go out and we can reproduce more disciples. We agree on the important stuff. Right. You know, I just know not to preach that at your church because I have a respect and a reverence for you. Right. And I'm not going to introduce something in your church that's opposite of what your doctrine is or what you're teaching. Right. So with discord, it's simply a conversation. Now, with offense, there has to be an examination of the heart. The Bible tells us what? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who could know it? Just because you feel some type of way don't mean that you're right. It don't mean that you're in line with the word. You can quote the Bible and be wrong all day because the root of why you're offended is something you assumed either because of your view 
or a past hurt experience, met, they didn't do anything wrong. It's very possible that you're just being triggered by what you need to be delivered by. Mm. So when Come we on. address why, we got to sit long enough with ourselves and have the <laughs> honest conversation before God. Okay, Lord, I'm offended, but why am I offended? Mm -hmm. This reminds me of what my daddy used to say. This reminds me of what my pastor said before they put me out my last church. This reminds me of what minister so-and-so said before they cut me off. When we get to the root of a lot of our offense, it's not even about what the other person did. It's about something that's resol not resolved in us that we have not dealt with. Now, if there's a legitimacy in the offense, then there's a conversation for that. The passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 18 it, it, it specifically deals with when your brother sins against you. We think people disagreement with us is them sinning against us. That's the first thing we got to deal with. There are too many believers that have an inflated sense of self. Oh, that ain't right. The Bible said we need to fix this. Is it worth fixing biblically? You might not like what they said, but it, did they biblically, when we hold it up to the word, did they really sin against you or your ego was just a little bit bruised? And, and when we look at stuff like that, we lose a lot of relationships yes. mm -hmm. for no reason. We did a series of, um, a couple of months ago dealing with kinship in the local household of faith and dealing with quarrel and discord and how to deal with a lot of these things. And if somebody sins against you, yes, you need to go to them alone. But what I find is what a lot of people do, just like in your example, A, they either go run and tell the pastor mm -hmm. or somebody else. Or B, they love to confront you with people. And it's Come like, on. okay, you 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 find yourself in a meet nor in a whole larger conversation. And it's like, okay, what were you gonna tell me about this before mm -hmm. you blindsided me with all of these people? Mm -hmm. Go to the person by yourself, by your whole self, mm -hmm. because that is what yeah. if they actually <laughs> sinned against you, they done wronged you biblically, go to them by yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the answer you need, then you bring two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. That don't work. Okay, then you need to bring it before the church. And this is a lost art. People don't do this anymore. A lot of people still think this is wrong. And I get it because the church has mishandled a lot of situations. We've made people stand up before the whole congregation and confess they sin. And it's like, okay, biblically, this isn't something that needs to be told to the whole church. Because if you're spiritual and meek and you're going to restore them in meekness, everybody don't need to know what they did for you to restore them. So I believe seeing that has brought a lot of people to where they don't like this. But if you've mm -hmm. gone to them in, in private, they won't hear you. You've brought two or three witnesses, they won't hear you. And y'all, are especially when y'all are a part of the same local church, the same household of faith, at that point, it does need to be brought before the church to weigh in. Because the goal is what? To bring this person back into right state, right reconcile and right relationship. And when we really honor the local church as kinship, when we see them as family, when we stop mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, we, we are okay. brothers and sisters in Christ, when mm -hmm. you really honor that church family, you understand that the purpose is not embarrassment. The purpose is to bring the family back together on one accord. Uh, yeah. And, 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 then, and then it says, if they don't hear you, treat them like a tax collector, or if we want to be honest, an unbeliever. So, you know, we have a lot of people now where we can still be friends with people that left our church. In most cases, yes. But if there's somebody that left on these terms and had to be brought before the church and they are that offended, they refuse to reconcile, they refuse to deal with the issue. The Bible says, treat them like a tax collector. That's what the word says. Somebody who is set and holding a grudge of discord they're set they they they've had the conversation going back to your example the conversation has mm. been had they don't want to hear you they don't want to hear the pastor they don't want to hear the elders they don't want to hear what nobody got to say they are set on being offended and having an attitude you can't be friends with that person even if you wanted to because they're uh -huh. not going to deal with you if we're going to be honest they're not so it really deals with summarizing this. Number one, you got to first understand what you're dealing with. Is it discord? Mm -hmm. Is it offense? Or did somebody actually sin against you? Oh, yeah. That tells you how to handle it. And then if you have gone through the necessary biblical steps and they refuse to reconcile, to deal with the issue, there's not a whole lot that you can do with that. It just really isn't. But it comes down to definition. A lot of us, mm -hmm. we have a view of ourselves that needs to be shifted. Yes, we we 
have to see ourselves as who we are. We're created in his image and likeness. But if we just begin to focus on righteousness rather than who's right or who's wrong, a lot of these things can be cleared up with a simple conversation. And then also in that passage of scripture, man, that was so good. That was good. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but but you got to look at in that passage of scripture too in Matthew 18. Who was mm -hmm. he talking to? Mm-hmm. He said, what, if thy brother, see, this is dealing with the brethren. Yeah. The scripture mm -hmm. talking about the brethren, it's talking about the church. Mm -hmm. And he and, and he was telling Jesus was telling his disciples how to handle conflict among the brethren. Yes. Right. But then it says, it, 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 it says, you know, after you, you treat him as an unbeliever, and then it says, uh, uh, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Mm -hmm. we, we think that's talking about demons. Mm -hmm. We think that's talking about demons, but we're talking, we're talking about, we're talking about unreconciled believers here. Right. So, mm -hmm. so. And, and, and remember, he was talking to the apostles, remember church of government, apostolic government, he was talking to the apostles yes. about how to set up structures for accountability in handling offense in the church. Yes. Oh my goodness. See, 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 we, we, we don't understand how important the church is to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to where he would tell the apostles, this is how you handle disgruntled, unreconciled believers. Yes. So he said, you know, um, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So uh, a binding and loosing is dealing with uh, uh, forbidding and permitting. Yes. So he says, in these type of situations, whatever you permit, I'm going to permit. Mm -hmm. Whatever you forbid, I'm going to forbid. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then he said, when two or three are gathered together, he, he said, well, uh, what if any of you shall agree on earth touching as anything, uh, 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 they shall ask, it shall be done unto them of my Father which is in heaven. This is talking about apostolic judgment yes. in the midst of believers who Ooh. refuse to reconcile. Mm -hmm. So God said, if you have a believer who has a legitimate offense that they refuse to get rid of, they refuse to reconcile with their brother or sister, you have the power from heaven to bind that person, in other words, to forbid him from the fellowship, and God himself will back you. Mm. And not only that, they are to be marked mm -hmm. by every church. See, we, 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 this, this is how much God values unity. Yes. This is why the, the, this is why the Bible says if you, if you hate your brother, you are a liar. Mm -hmm. Come on. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? God, God, God said, God, listen, you can't say that you love your brother and sister. You can't reconcile with. I'm talking about like, like you said, mm -hmm. legitimate offense. A lot of stuff ain't legitimate either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm talking about legitimate offenses. You know, we're, we're talking about Jesus said, I'm I'm in the midst of this when you do this. Mm. Come on. That ain't talking about prayer. <laughs> Contextually, <laughs> it ain't talking about prayer. Mm -hmm. We love to say when we two and three gather together, <laughs> that ain't <bad>. yeah. <laughs> and we think it's yes. talking about prayer. <laughs> but if you read it in context, and I'm a context person when it comes to scripture, you read it in context, it's talking about properly judging among believers who do not repent for offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, That's how much God hates division among his people. Now that's Bible. Mm -hmm. This is good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm still taking notes, you know. <laughs> I'm learning some things on today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and, and, and see, if 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 we would just implement this in our churches, I, I, listen uh, again. I I, I believe. Uh, I believe Christopher, Minister Christopher said earlier about being, churches being seeker sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we stop yes. being so seeker sensitive and really get back to some of the basic principles mm -hmm. of governing relationships among the saints. Yes. You may lose some people, but you'll maintain the purity and the Woo! integrity of what God yes. wants to establish. 
These yes. things like this is what made the early church so powerful in the earth. Mm -hmm. This would made the, the apostles in the early church so powerful in the earth. This would cause the church to become a superpower in the earth by standards like these. Mm. Go and float up to the church that, that, that will accept you, but just know that if we mark you, okay, you've been marked by heaven, you've been marked by God, and whatever church you're holding, whatever church you go to, they're housing a rebel. Mm, because you refuse to reconcile with your brother and your sister. So, oh, honestly, oh. some people are going to lose their souls behind this one passage of scripture alone. Mm -hmm. Come on. Because the greatest commandment is love. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, glory. I felt that. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> come on. I'm sorry. Look, come on with it now. The yes. greatest oh. commandment, the greatest commandment <laughs> is love. Mm -hmm. And if you love your brother, see, we, let me say this. And this is the hypocrisy we have. And the Lord expressed this to me one day. This is the hypocrisy we have. Because we have more mercy on our child molesting uncle than we do believers. Come on, come on here, come on, come on now. I, I, I you know, you, you know, we we've, we've heard horror stories of people of some of the things that their family members have done to them. But that's my mama, that's my daddy, that's still my uncle, that's still my brother, and you face him at the family reunion. Okay, every year. Every year, but you can't talk to your brother or sister. Woo. Some things, some things, some things you can mm. you can fix with an apology and corresponding action to do right by that person. You know, but nowadays, but nowadays believers are so toxic. That you got to separate yourself. What is that? What is that? Mm. You know, we have more. And, and, and the Lord told me how he feel about it. Because see, we got to look at it from God's perspective, not mm -hmm. ours. Mm -hmm. Because we going to always choose our dysfunctional relatives over the church. <laughs> Come on here. Come on now. Uh, 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 right. uh, uh, um, I, you know, I've met people. I mean, daddies used to mm. beat them. Abuse him. But oh, he's a good father. What? <laughs> Negative. He's a good father. He bought the bacon home, but he's banging your head up against the wall. Okay. But he's a good father. But then, oh God, but don't let your pastor mess up. Okay. <laughs> don't let your pastor make a mistake. Okay. You will you will stay connected to that abusive good father. But then mm -hmm. You won't show mercy to another believer? My God, yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to see how God feels about that. It's not even about how we feel. How does God feel? Mm -hmm. I don't think we consider how God, how Jesus yeah. feels about stuff. You understand? So if anybody out there dealing with offense or anything like that, listen, you got to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. It's not worth your soul, baby. Mm -hmm. It ain't yeah. worth your soul. Forgive oh, folks and forgive quickly. Come on. Jesus. Yes, Woo. yes, yes. We got um some questions in the chat, but okay. I'm gonna shout out my um my sister that's on here, Prophetess Regina Gamble Scott. She is knocking out these questions in the chat. Amen. <laughs> She's knocking them out. <laughs> <laughs> But we got one, um, Pastor Damon didn't give her um, any uh, more to it. So let me go ahead and ask the question that he initially asked is, what is the proper way for a pastor to sit down a person in leadership in their church who was acting or living in sin without the scourge in the congregation? Hmm. I want to give somebody else a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher, you've been quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's we'll let him time. speak and then we'll chime in later. <laughs> yeah. Say it, say it one more time so I can hear it clearly. Okay, let me go back to it. What is a proper way for a pastor to sit down a person in leadership 
in their church who is acting or living in sin without discouraging the congregation. Without discouraging the congregation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the part that, that kind of threw me off the first time. Uh, whenever there's a person in, in leadership that's living in sin or who committed a certain act, uh, I, I always think that the first method or the first approach is an approach towards restoration. And uh, I, I always, for, for scripture's sake, take that passage in Galatians. Yes. About when your brother has fallen, those who are spiritual, uh, reach out to them for, the rest, for restoring a brother. And uh, I, I believe in that. I believe that as, as church leaders and us who have been given this ministry, we have a, a not just an authority, but we have a duty to uphold a standard. And we can just allow anything to happen and anything to go forth because um, what we allow impacts the congregation as well. Mm -hmm. so we have, you know, leaders serving, doing things, acting, you know, living in sin. And, uh, we don't check those things. That gives the congregation access to do that plus more. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe in that. I believe that we have to uh, maintain the standard. And I, my example for how I model those things is I, I, I believe in talking to people privately. Uh, I believe in sitting leaders down, especially leaders. Um, now, members of the congregation, that's that's a different approach, but we're talking about leaders for this question. Mm -hmm. Sit leaders down, meet with leaders, uh, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, bring up the offense, the sin, uh, the thing that's been brought forth or the accusation, give them a chance to respond. And if it's true that they are committing that act or living in that sin, not only pray for them, but pray for their deliverance, move forward toward their delivery and then try to enact a plan of restoration. If there's a genuine repentance, if there's a genuine, you know, I, I believe I was wrong, uh, I did this and I want to get better, then you can move toward a plan of restoration. But uh, I, I don't believe in that it has to be eternal, that you don't necessarily depend on, depending on what it is, you just say it like that, depending on what it is, it don't have to necessarily be we're going to sit you down for good or revoke your membership for good, depending on what it is. Because there are some extreme cases where you might have to just sit somebody down permanently. Or you might, might, might have to, uh, you know, uh, with, withdraw your uh, fellowship at, at your church, depending on how serious the accusation is. But sometimes, uh, if there's not anything extreme, you can kind of move toward a plan of restoration if that person's gene is repentant. And then kind of uh, disciple them. Uh, if we're responsible for the leadership and everything like that, and we, we're the person given authority of a congregation or in, in any sort of leadership, then not just as, uh, not just we're the supreme leaders, whatever that's supposed to mean, but we're also given charge to, help, to be held accountable for the staff, for the other leaders as well. And so we have to maintain that standard, number one, within ourselves. But then we also have to help our brothers and other leaders who are serving with us when they should fall and try to get them back in good standing with the Lord first, help them get back in good standing with the family, the congregation, and then restore them back to ministry. I believe in restoration. So that's my word. That was good. Okay. I want to read something real quick. Um, and I definitely agree. The, the, the goal should always be restoration. Mm -hmm. The goal should always be restoration. I definitely agree with that uh, scripture in Galatians 6 1. Uh, uh, and, and I want to add to that too. I want to read something uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I'm going to read uh, verse 19. It says, Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. 
uh, verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that the others may fear. Now it says, first and foremost, if it's against a leader, uh, okay, don't even receive the accusation unless it's about two or three witnesses. That part. Okay. So, 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 so if two or three people are affected by this particular leader's actions, okay, then that's when it needs to be addressed openly. But if it's just one, if it's one witness, okay, that means that I believe then it should be addressed privately. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it's just one witness to this thing, okay, hey, let's address this privately here, okay, because it ain't spread. You, you're not trafficking your iniquity right now. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Remember the Bible says Lucifer trafficked his iniquity. Okay. So, so, so it can be handled pri pri uh, uh, privately because it's not spreading. Mm -hmm. Mm. But, but when it comes to two or three witnesses, okay, you didn't, you didn't did the same thing with two or three witnesses or two or three witnesses are affected in the same way. Okay, then that's when you got to take it, take it before open it, because that's that's when you are continuously doing the same thing over and over again. It's not one slip up. It's not a mistake or whatever. This is something that you have continuously done. Okay, it says uh, them that sin rebuke before all that the others may fear mm -hmm. or that the others may reverence God. Right. But then you notice it don't say immediately set them down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the most humbling experience is, is, is having to still serve before the same people you got rebuked in front of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, because the goal, again, is still restoration. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, your stuff is affecting the congregation now, so it has to be addressed openly now. Mm -hmm. But, 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 but I believe, uh, like the man of God said, in, in extreme cases, yes, okay, a person should okay be either sat down or per permanently like sat down, excommunicated or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if a leader, if a leader in your organization, your congregation, uh uh, uh sins habitually and continually, and they spread that thing around, it has to be addressed openly. You know, but for the purposes of restoration, you know, this is why, you know, you know, you know I used to be quick to sit folk down back in the day, but, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not, I, I've, I've learned since I've matured and I've grown, you know, in this understanding, you know, if I have to address something uh, uh, openly, if I have to, the purposes is for restoration. Not to embarrass you, but to, hey, let everybody know this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. So when people don't have no more self control, it got to be addressed openly. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it, but it, but 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 I prefer to get it before it gets that way. Yes. Before it go that far. But again, you know, you you can't even receive an accusation that's about two or three witnesses mm -hmm. because people lie on leaders all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know how many times we'd have been lied on? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> People lie on leaders all the time. It, it, it is a it is a coveted position. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a coveted position, whether you're a senior leader, associate leader, or whatever. So people will lie on you. Mm -hmm. If you if if you are in blatant sin, is is I'm telling you, it's gonna show. Mm -hmm. And more than one person, or or of or you're trafficking your iniquity. It's gonna get out. Mm -hmm. It it's gonna get out. That's why I tell everybody: time tells all things. Mm -hmm. It does. Time tells all things. If somebody has some serious error, some serious sin, it's gonna show. That's good. But if your stuff begin to show, and your leader get a hold of it before it gets that far, you're blessed. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's all I gotta say about that one. That's good. <laughs> I, I want to touch on the part of the question that spoke about without discouraging the, co the congregation. Yes. One of the hardest things you have to face as a leader, when you have to make these kinds of decisions, you cannot 100% avoid this. I'm, I'm going to just mm -hmm. say that, that that's why leadership is a hard job for a lot yeah. of people. You have to be called to it and you have to be fortified and have a prayer life. 
you will not 100% be able to avoid this. Why? And I'm only speaking generally because I, I don't know the details. But let's say, for example, this person was an associate pastor, or let's say they was the pastor of uh, you know, the evangelism or the outreach ministry. Usually when there are people that will be discouraged, this person has a prominent role in the church. This is what I call a power player. Somebody who's been set and delegated authority in that local church that has influence over a group of people within that church. They're leading a subdivision or a sub ministry in that church. That is a power player. That somebody has influence and to have influence, somebody has to look up to you and believe in you. Nobody believes in you or looks up to you. You don't have any influence and you don't need that position. Mm -hmm. So yeah. therefore you cannot a hundred percent avoid people being discouraged. Somebody going to be disappointed. Oh right. my God, Pastor Bob. Oh, he's not, well, who could be doing outreach now? I don't know to go no more because you're dealing with sheep people at different maturity levels so you cannot 100 percent avoid that and you have to prepare yourself and the rest of your leadership team Pre prepare your admins somebody gonna be calling well i want to sit down and meet with the pastor i want to know why that's the part i'm not gonna be doing the outreach that happens when you have a congregation and you are dealing with people who are still maturing in the faith and they may not understand how all these things work you got to be prepared for people to be disappointed. You have to be prepared for a bunch of people want to meet with you. You got to be prepared for the people that want to try to tell you off. Well, I don't think you should have did that. <laughs> you got, and, and in extreme cases, you have to be prepared for the people that may leave because they don't like your decision. All of these things deal with the heart of leadership. So when you are a senior leader and you have to make these decisions, these are the things that come with it and i'm speaking from head knowledge reading books but also real life experience and it's part of it you have to know how to keep your composure and continue to move on with what god has given you these things are not personal but these are the byproducts sometimes with dealing with people and you understand how people function you don't take it personal at the end of the day god has set you in that set position as set authority in that house, in that ministry. And at the end of the day, you got to be able to go, to go to sleep at night knowing mm -hmm. that when you go before God and you have to give an account for your actions, for where God has set you over, where God has given you a vision to carry out and to materialize in this earth, that you know at the end of the day, I know I'm going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, because I went with God and not with people. I went with God and not with tithes and offerings. I went with God and not membership, and I went with God and not platforms. That's mm. where you have to Come be on. with that. And so it's something when people get all mad, well, okay, I understand. God bless you. I, I hear what you're saying. So one of the best ways you can, and it depends on where the situation is. So the person that asked, asked the question in your mind, don't write in the chat because I don't want all this out, but just think about in your mind where the situation is. If it's early on, your best bet would be what I call the long cup of coffee conversation. <laughs> This is where you take this person out to lunch, out to dinner, or out to coffee, wherever they like to go, and you have a nice conversation with them according to the word. Hear their side. Hear what they're going through and what they're dealing with. If you can show this person in the word where it would be beneficial for them to step down and take a sabbatical right now, that would be the best bet. Because then it don't have to be addressed. Well, why did so-and-so get sat down? Why can't so-and-so do this? It would just be them resigning, stepping back, taking a sabbatical, you know, to take some time to hear from God. And, and when they are ready, we're going to put them back in place. Publicly, that looks better than you having to sit the person now. But depending upon where they are in their offense, you just may not be able to take it that way. So my prayers are with you. Think about where the situation is. Think about what has happened so far. And if you still have some time to win this person over and get them to agree to a sabbatical before you have to just have to sit them down. Hmm. That was good. We got another question in the chat. I'm sorry, was someone going to say something? Maybe I'm hearing things. Okay. <laughs> so Pastor Damon, you just getting us all off um track here we like i like order and i'm over here i'm looking at my notes I'm like, we didn't get to half of this stuff but i want to get your questions answered as well i want to leave y'all hanging so um pastor damon wants to know the difference between a pastor and a bishop oh boy <laughs> <laughs> i knew it when i saw that question i said pastor line of a fall out <laughs> oh boy huh 
<laughs> you want to tackle this one? I'll let you tackle that one. Okay. So, so uh, first of all, the word bishop in the Greek, it means overseer. Mm -hmm. So it's speaking to the position of someone who has oversight over a local congregation. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Now we've made the bishop more than what it what it really mm -hmm. was, and I know through through church history, you know some some things kind of added to the role or whatnot. But at the heart of it, the bishop is an overseer. Mm -hmm. um, you're only a bishop when you're the overseer or the senior leader mm -hmm. of an organization. Okay, um, um, or or ministry. So. The apostles had a bishop because they was over the church. Yes. Right? Because they was over the church. But every apostle did not have a church. A lot of them came into the bishopric later. All right? Because, again, bishopric is when you are the overseer over a local congregation. So, so uh, uh, the first ones who held the bishopric position was the apostles. Mm-hmm. All right. So under that order, okay, was the fivefold ministry, including the pastor. Okay. So if a pastor is not a senior leader of a congregation, he's not a bishop. But technically, what we call the senior pastor today, which you know, that can that that can be debated too. That can that I can dissect that whole thing, but I'm not, is technically a bishop. Mm -hmm. and under the bishop is the more matured leaders mm -hmm. who we call elders yes okay that is that that is the difference okay um um, um uh, uh, if you are a part of like a ministry staff and you are the more experienced spiritually mature okay then the rest of them then technically you're an elder but the senior elder would be considered the bishop and which in scriptural times was mainly held by the apostles mm -hmm. okay it was mainly held by the apostles now if you get the church at antioch in acts 13 uh, uh prophets and teachers govern that church mm -hmm. okay so prophets and teachers kind of held the bishopric position uh, 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 and eldership, okay? Um, but but they were still connected to the Jerusalem church, which was governed by the apostles. That's a different teaching too. But to answer your question, <laughs> to answer your question, the difference between a pastor and a bishop, so bishop is the, is the, seat, is the set leader, Okay. Um, uh, which probably in biblical, which in biblical times was the apostle or maybe a prophet. All right. And uh, the pastor fell under that order among the sheep. Hope I answered your question. Yeah, that's good, Apostle. Thank you. Okay. We got another question from uh, Tamika. And she says, What if you desire to walk in your full purpose and want to walk in your full calling? but feel so stuck, you constantly cry because you feel, I'm sorry, it's just a period. You feel from your deep belly, greatness won't let you forget about greatness in your dreams, visions and dreams. Hopefully I read that right. I'll let somebody else answer that one. Um, Minister Shanika, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I was gonna ask if you could repeat that, I'm sorry. I was okay. trying to catch it. Gotcha. What if you desire to walk in your, your full purpose and want to walk in your full calling, but feel so stuck you constantly cry because you feel from your deep belly greatness won't let you forget about greatness in your visions and dreams. Hmm. And maybe, uh, Miss Tamika, you could reward it a little bit because I, I don't mm -hmm. think, um, I don't understand it too much. Yeah, I mean, for me, I would say, you know, it, it took me a while to, to walk in my purpose. It took me a while to accept the call that God had on my life. I mean, I just accepted this call that I'm walking in now. And a lot of times we're stuck because we, we're in that comfort zone. 
and you know, it's comfortable where we at and, and we're afraid, you know, we know that God is calling us to more, but I'm comfortable right here. I know what it's like right here. And if I go over here where God is calling me, I may not understand mm. everything. Or I, I, I may not, I may not be successful because I don't really know what's over there. But if you know in your gut, if you feel it, then you, it's time for you to get out of your comfort zone. It's time for you Amen. to trust God. That's where that trust come in. You know what? Mm. I'm going to trust God on this because I feel like there's more to my life. And we all, you know, there's got to be more to my life. You know, we've all said that when we're trying to figure out our purpose. And so you feel it in your gut. You know, you, you, you can't stop thinking about it because God is calling you higher. He's calling you higher. And it's time for you to move. And, you know, you got you to gotta be able to say, you know, Lord, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's over there, but Lord, I trust you. And know that God is already there. He's already cleared the way for you. He's already paved the way for you. So if you feel that in your gut, that that's from God, then you need to go ahead and take a step of faith. You need to go ahead and step out on faith and do it. You know, uh, yeah, you're going to do it scared, but do it. Once you make that step, my God, God is already there. He's already, he's waiting on you. A lot of times we say, I'm waiting on God to give me a sign. This is your sign. You feel it. You feel it. You feel that burning inside of you. That's God is saying, I'm calling you higher. I have more for you. This is not where I want you to stay. There are some things that I need you to do, but you can't do them here. You got to do them over there. So, you know, for me, you need to just move. God is saying move. He's telling you to move, but you're looking for a concrete sign. That's not no concrete sign. He's telling mm -hmm. you, it's time to move. I'm calling mm -hmm. you higher. You got some things that I need you to do, but you can't do them in that comfort zone. You got to move. It's some people Arra. over there that's waiting on you to do yes. what you're supposed yes. to do so they can get move. to where they need to get to. So Tamika, I'm telling you on today, it's time to move. Pray and ask that God, I'm ready. God, I trust you. God, I'm saying yes. Oh God, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to walk mm -hmm. in my purpose. And I'm telling you, it's going to work out for you. Yeah, yes. you're going to be scared. Yeah, you may not understand it, but that's okay. God has you. He just needs you to trust him. He just needs you to say, yes, God. Yes, mm -hmm. Lord, I will go. Send me, I will go. He's Amen. waiting on you to come from that comfort zone. Yes, yes. Trust God and mm. get connected somewhere where you can yes. be discipled cultivated and developed into the call and destiny that God has placed on your life. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I was reading the comments, kind of grasping more of what you were saying. So it sounds like God is already stirring up the gifts within mm -hmm. you. And as uh, Minister Shanika was saying, you're to a place where God is now disrupting your comfort. So, so much so to the point that you can't even continue on. You said it's down in your belly. You, you see it in your dreams. Your whole life is being disrupted with purpose. When you My go God. about your day, there is purpose. You're distracted by purpose. When Come you on. go to sleep at night, your sleep is disrupted by purpose. Uh, God is going to disrupt your life mm, with purpose until you on. answer purpose. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. keep doing what you're going to do. So yeah. if you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know what to do next. You got to get connected. Be connected mm -hmm. somewhere where you can be discipled in the purpose. Uh, be connected cool. somewhere where you can be developed and trained, equipped and yes. sent out so you can fulfill this purpose. Mm. And at the rate that God is disrupting in your life with purpose right now i want to say to you prophetically mm. this means this is time sensitive this tells me prophetically god has been knocking on your door with purpose for a very long time maybe you didn't answer because you were scared as minister shanika was saying maybe you didn't answer because of life situations or maybe you didn't feel qualified and it was something in yourself mm. but I, I want to encourage you that now is the time if this is burning in your belly to where you can't yes. sleep at night you're going to be miserable until you <laughs> answer this because God is trying to get your attention. And, but I also want to tell you, God, this is time sensitive. You don't have another six months to think about it or feel or see what God is saying. You got about 30 to 45 business days to get connected somewhere uh, where you on, can be developed in this. Come on. Yes. Now yes. is the time. Write down yes. the things that you are seeing and feeling, even if you don't understand it. Write them down, time and date, because God is going to come back to it later. It's going to make sense to you. But mm -hmm. you yeah. have to be connected to where you can be developed a purpose that is not being moved upon is simply potential 
And God is desiring a return in his investment. That's why he's disrupting everything that concerns you uh, because he wants your life in alignment with what concerns him. Yeah. And that's your yeah. purpose. He needs you to be a part of his kingdom will and agenda he in the earth. Now is the time. I love that. Come on. Come My on. God. Come on. Yeah. Come on. yeah. I, want to, I, I want to add to that too. Be prepared. Do not get comfortable where you are. I don't know where you live at. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know where you live, but the thing that God is requiring you to do is going to relocate you to your land of promise. And that is the word of the Lord. Yes. Yes. I was going to say earlier when Minister Shanika said, now's the time to move, move. I'm like, she's speaking in the spirit, but Jesus. I hear it. it I, I hear God saying that as an instruction. So you're going to have to pray and see what that looks like for you. What, what that actually means for you. But in some, rather it's to move your location, to move where you fellowship, yeah, to move some coach, things in your life, to Come move on. circumstance. There is something in your life that needs to move. Yes. 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 Okay. And she just said, I keep hearing is two words, time sensitive and invest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to add, and yes. I'm going to be simple here. I'm not going to be too deep. Fast and pray. My God. That's how I get all my clarity. You're going to have to push out some stuff. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to push out some people and you're going to have to push out some places. Get before God fast and pray. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of people, they don't want to give up stuff. When you are called by God, you're going to have to give up some stuff. Come on. Yes. Okay. Fast and pray. And I see a, a bunch of our ICAM family on here. Please put in, um, the link for ICAM, our Friday services. Please put that in there for Miss Tamika. Amen. And uh, Miss Tamika, everybody that's on this, um, um, the the call, everybody that's on the Zoom, yes. uh, please uh, read. Um, I'm trying to say follow, because the apostles they they are awesome. They are amazing. Okay, yes. you want to be connected to the right people. Oh my God, you have to be connected to the right people. Okay. Um, there was something else. I'm sorry. It'll come back to me. Um, well, we got another question in the chat. Let me see. From Pastor Damon again. He said, what is the best way for a five-fold leader to uh, maintain their personal walk with God while attending to the needs of ministry? What is mm -hmm. a strategy to keep yourself from becoming burnt out? Mm. Ooh. Hmm. take a vacation <laughs> <laughs> yeah for real I, I was I, I had to learn balance I had to learn balance because I was so ministry driven um, that um, you know I didn't want to take a vacation with my wife I was so ministry driven you understand and, and and you can have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Mm. You know, um, that, now I ain't say take 50 vacations, okay? Because mm -hmm. some folks take that too far, <laughs> okay? You going on vacation every other month, yeah. okay? Uh -huh. But it's good to take some me time. I, 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 I tell some leaders, find you a hobby or something. Find something that you like to do. You know, if you like if you like hunting, if you like roller coasters, you like fishing, Find something you like to do. Invest in a hobby or something. You know, um, um, maybe you like a maybe you like a, a a series or something on TV or something. Okay, like like I like superhero stuff, so I'm watching The Flash and all that stuff right now. You know, find 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 you find you some normalcy without carnality. Amen. You know, find something that you like to do and do that. And, and believe me, you can even hear God and even even in those environments, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because 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 God can speak anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. but you you got to find you got to find a balance, um, especially if you're a senior leader, mm -hmm. you got to find some kind of balance or some kind of peace or something like that. You know, I remember my wife and I, we didn't always take, you know, vacations and we didn't always take time for ourselves because it was just ministry all the time. And then things became frustrating. And then I just got, you know, you know, you know, we, we all became burnt out, mm -hmm. churched out because, you know, 
you know, you know, due to we always, I mean, even Jesus got away, even if it was to the mountain to pray. Mm -hmm. At least he got away from all the noise, all the responsibility, you know, and just got away alone with God on the mountain. You know, you gotta find your own mountaintop experience mm -hmm. as far as normalcy without compromise is concerned. Find something that you like to do and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you, 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 uh, 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 I just saw something earlier where, you know, they, um, having a uh, cross country tickets, you know, for the train or whatever, take like four days to, to, uh, I guess go to one side of the country and back, you know, I to <laughs> find something, if that's what you like to do, mm -hmm. you know, you know, but, but, but you got to find some kind of balance, you know, and, um, because if you don't, you will be burnt out. So invest, invest in your peace, invest in that part of you. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to add to that is delegate. Anytime you have leaders that are dealing with a lot of burnout, in addition to not taking time is the issue of a lack of delegation or the need for more delegation. If this, we're talking about a senior leader in a church You've got elders, you've got deacons, you've got ministers. Mm -hmm. There are tasks you should be delegating and outsourcing for them to complete. Yeah. Sometimes if you have a lack of help, find your team, pick some people that like the Bible yeah. said, full of faith, lay hands on them, disciple these people, train them, and then put them in place so you can start to shift some of your tasks to them. A lot of pastors sometimes, they, they grow in ministry seasons change. And, you know, we like to do things the way we did in the beginning. And you got to realize we're not there no more. Now mm -hmm. there's a shift to where you have a team, you have people in place, and you can now offload some of those tasks and responsibilities to the people who are there serving in, in these positions of influence. So delegate, give them some stuff to do. And a lot of times there's probably somebody there that, you know, they may be a relative or a friend that, you know, you, they're not pulling their weight, shift them and put somebody mm -hmm. else in place that will fulfill the job correctly. You know, a lot of pastors, they start off small. So they might have friends that they was in ministry with friends from seminary school, friends from wherever, relatives, cousins, uncles, whoever. And then as the weight of ministry, well, I, I can't put that on them. If they're <laughs> fulfilling the position, yes, put it on them, delegate it to them. And if they can't handle it or they won't handle it, then shift them out for somebody who's going to carry out the job correctly right. the way it needs to be carried out. You can't have people holding up your arms, but then they stopping to go do other stuff all the time. Then if they're going to hold your arms up, they need to hold your arm up the whole the time so wow. you need to delegate put people in place let go step back if, if if things can't run without you for a couple of weeks then you really need to assess who's on your leadership team because yeah. that means you've got somebody holding the vision that's not really holding the vision the way that they need to so it's time for an in-house assessment delegation Ooh. adjustment and you might have to change out some players and put some people on the bench I thought. Yes, ma'am. Mm. You guys still hearing my headphones went out? Yes. We yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me see. If we got any more questions? I'd like to have order, but I'd like to be, you know, follow the Holy Spirit as well. Yes. So we're Amen. all good. Um. Okay. So our next um topic was the fear of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have too many scriptures, so I'm not going to read all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so let me go ahead and I'm going to go to Genesis 42, 18. Genesis 42, mm -hmm. 18. Where are we at? Where did it go to? Okay. Then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live for I fear God. For I fear God. A lot of people don't fear God anymore. <laughs> whatever they want to do, they say whatever they want to say mm. and they do it all in his church, on the yeah. pulpit. And it just amazes me because I'm just like, what happened to the fear of God? Right. 
you know, we have to answer to him when we go before him. We have to answer for what we've done mm -hmm. here on this earth. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Where to go to? Where the fear of God go? Mm -hmm. I, I'll speak to that. We, we can take this a number of ways, but yeah. summing it up from my experience and from what I have seen um, in the time that I've been in ministry, I believe a lot of the heavy handedness in, in church leadership and the mishandling of things in the name of God has contributed to a lack of fear of God or reverence of God, because we have seen a whole generation of leaders, you know, fathers in the faith, mothers in the faith that have treated people all types of ways mm. in the name of God, uh. you know, and as more and more of these unfortunate situations, you know, come to light, you know, with different types of things that have happened, people are like, people are taking us as a joke. I believe that's part of it. And the other part of it is our need to look like culture instead of us taking up the other part of our apostolic commandment to be a change agent that transforms culture. We want to look like the, the, the world so bad. We're bringing everything that the world does in the church saying, hey, you can do all this and still be saved too. And when mm. people are looking at the world and they're looking at the church and they're looking at the world and they're looking yeah. at the church and if they can't see a difference, there's nothing there for them to reverence. Come on. Mm. So we have to look at that too. Another element that I have noticed that have played into the lack of the fear of God is this transparency movement. Now, let oh. me premise this with this. I believe there's a certain amount of transparency that is healthy. Okay, if you look like the perfect pastor that never had to depend on God for anything, okay, that's going to make some people feel like, okay, this thing is impossible. It, it's, I believe in testimony. We overcome by the word of the lamb, by the, uh, the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. We need testimony. People need to hear at some point they pass and say, hey, I was mad at God at one point, but God showed himself faithful. I repented. I got it. My heart, I got my heart right. I reconciled. Those things are healthy, but I've noticed within the last 10 years, this transparency movement has shifted in a way that isn't actually biblical. So now you have people in the pulpit telling all kinds of stuff and what I believe becoming over personal on mm -hmm. the pulpit as well as on social media. And then when people have a lack of reverence or they lash out and maybe say things they shouldn't say, I'm still the pastor, I'm still the man of God, I'm still the woman of God. Well, if you would have not put all your business out in the name of transparency, they would have not had these stones to throw at you. You handed them the bag of stones. So it goes into a number of different things. The first thing that we have to do is get back in alignment with God. We need to repent, pray, and go back to God's original vision and understanding for how his church is supposed to be set up. One thing that I respect about the old school, you just didn't treat the pastor any type of way. Mm -hmm. There was a reverence, even if you was mad, even if you was going through stuff, even if you didn't agree with who they elevated or who they put over this, there was a reverence there. And so we have to get back to that understanding of set authority. You may not like something they said, you might not like something they did, but that doesn't mean that God is now giving you the right to dishonor them and to disrespect them because you don't like something. When we first reconcile this in our own relationship with God, it's easier to carry on a culture of reverence and honor within the church and within the body of Christ. And this brings us back to a place of developing true holiness and righteousness. When we are reconciled to God the way we should be, Paul said, all things are lawful, but all, all things are not profitable. Just because you can do something, should you? Mm -hmm. Is there a real benefit to it? And again, all this, Dr. Tamar ties back into discipleship, because when we disciple people correctly, this is where we start to see some of these, these little red flags that we need to be watching out for. Okay, this person going to be a problem. Okay, you know what? This person like power too much. Okay, this person, no, they don't need the mic anytime soon, because it's going to be the me show, and it's not going to be anything about God. When we disciple people correctly, you need to take notes. You, you need to keep private notes to see what you're seeing what's coming out of people what god is showing you prophetically what well uh, i'm not too sure about that write it down 
When we look at a lot of these people mm -hmm. that get in the pulpit and say anything and do anything, I can guarantee if we trace them back to their first pastor or their first experience, the first couple of ministries they was in, some of these things were there then. Some of these red flags or concerns were there, but either it wasn't addressed or the person said, well, hon, they trying to stop my ministry. And they went from church to church to church mm -hmm. to somebody finally gave them what they wanted. And they finally had the platform to act in a way that wasn't in line <laughs> with having the fear of God in the reverence of God. So discipleship is needed. We've got to go back to wanting to be righteous and be in right standing with God. And we've got to be willing to stand out and transform culture instead of trying to mirror culture. Yep. Also, also I would add to that too, that um, we got to get back to the sacredness of ministry. We yes. still talk about the fear of God now. Just talk about the fear of God. Because see, one of the issues that we set in, in, in conversations like this, we like to separate God from the church. Mm. The church is the reason why Jesus died, is his body. Come on. So how you treat the church is how you treat God. My God. All right. So so we got to get back to the sacredness of ministry, period. You know, um, uh, nowadays we're getting very loose. Mm -hmm. uh, with how we treat the things of God, you yes, know, yes. Um, uh, with casual, when we do communion or, or as the Orthodox say, Eucharist, yeah. uh, we're, we're casual when it comes to uh, leadership. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I, listen, I'm not old school, but I do have, well, I'm, I'm, I'm new old school, old school <laughs> new. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a new school leader all day long i'm not old school but i believe that some of the things that that's from the old mm -hmm. we should have never lost amen all right uh we need to restore the sacredness of ministry you know um uh, none of us are better than each other mm -hmm. but we have different responsibilities mm -hmm. different offices mm -hmm. which requires different measures of authority and different honor levels right uh, 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 when you are in the army, when a superior officer comes in, everybody stops in and salutes, and you say at ease, mm -hmm. right? Right. See, because because it's it's a reverence for that office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that person paid the price, so they deserve that honor. Yes. So so it's the same thing, like you know, with uh, leadership. You know, um, um, uh, I believe that leaders need to sit on the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I believe in the seat of the senior leader. You know, it, it's actually biblical. Uh, 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 Jesus told the Pharisees, uh, y'all sit in Moses' seat. Mm. Moses had a seat of authority. Jesus also gave a, 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 a parable, and I'm going and I'm to paraphrase it here. When you go into an assembly, don't assume the front, don't, don't assume the front, front seat. Be called up front. Mm. because someone who's more eminent than you come on will come last okay and then they're gonna tell you get up and go to the back <laughs> right <laughs> we don't like the seating arrangements in church but the seating arrangements in churches are biblical mm. okay i believe in the senior leader having a different seat from the rest of the congregation why because they bear the responsibility mm -hmm of governing the their congregation some go wrong in their church they're gonna look at the pastor mm -hmm. the senior leader okay we don't like that kind of stuff we don't like sanctifying the sacred things of god mm -hmm. you know we, we 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 don't like that you know i remember uh back in the old baptist church i mean when the when, when the pastor came in everybody stood up that's it that's reverence. Okay, not not listen, when when I was a little boy and I used to think like the pastor was the closest thing to God. Uh -huh. <laughs> I used to I used to literally ask questions like okay, like is the pastor a normal man? <laughs> a normal woman? Mm -hmm. I didn't look to look at them as God, but mm -hmm. they was the preacher. That's it. So so if you the preacher and you preach it about God, I have I had a respect for you. Amen. You know, you know, I used to ask silly little questions like, okay, like, do do he go to the bathroom like a normal man? Like, is he normal? 
like 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 because you know um um you know he 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 was the man of God, mm-hmm. you know. So a, 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 you know, I see I, I seen him lay hands and operate in power. So I'm just mm-hmm. like, okay, like like, and, and this is in the Baptist church. So I'm just like, okay, like I just had a reverence for God. You know, nowadays your kids run on the pulpit. Oh, you know, oh, all Lord. kinds of stuff. And, oh, and you Jesus. know, you know, I'm a, 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 again, I'm not I'm not rigid and legalistic about mm-hmm. stuff. But I think some kind of standard should be set yes. in the church. You know, I remember they, they they had the old communion table. You better not touch that table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you you better not put nothing on that table. You better not touch that table. I don't care if it was communion if if it won't communion uh-huh. day. You won't gonna put nothing on that table. Mm-hmm. Why? Because that table was considered sacred because it was sanctified for the house of God. You know, I remember back in the day, you walk past the church, well, people uh, take their hat off, walk past the church. Mm. Now, nowadays, they smoking cigarettes in the church parking lot. Jesus. You understand? Now they're coming in and 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 and, and, and massacring people in the church. Mm. Now we gotta have security, we gotta carry pistols. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, you know. I remember back when I first gave my life to the Lord. The pastor didn't need no security. Mm-hmm. You understand? The, 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 you know, you know the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, arm bearers and all of them. They didn't have to pack pistols. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. like that, because there was an automatic respect mm-hmm. for the church and reverence for the mm-hmm. house of God. Even a criminal knew where to go to find God. That's it. But mm-hmm. because we've made the standard so low, because we try to be so modern, mm. you know, and and listen, I'm you, 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 you know you you can you, you know I'm all for casual dress. I preach in jeans every chance I get, all the time. But nowadays, I mean, we got flip flops and 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 and, 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 and ripped jeans with your knees out. I mean. I mean, no kind of standard. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least I'm preaching Chuck Taylors and Jordans. You know, the, the, these guys had their knees out. They got all kind of weird fashion. I'm like, what is this stuff? It looks, it looks, some of the stuff look gay to me, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> you know, no reverence. We got to bring back some kind of reverence in all your edginess. And I'm an edgy leader. You know, and all your edginess and all this, we got to bring back reverence for the sacred things of God because God takes it personally. And that scripture reference for when you're being invited, not assume the front seat, that's in Luke 14, verses 7 through 11, for those that's Bible. looking for the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're giving y'all Bible today. None of this stuff is made up, it's all in the Bible. All in the Bible. Um, so we're going to go ahead um, and go into honor. Okay. And jump into honor. Um, I'm going to read just one of my scriptures. I got quite a few, but I know we, um, we're we already over our time, which that's fine with me. I have no problem <laughs> going that's over. Right. I'm going to grill some chicken after this. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about God, Jesus, the church all day. Um, <laughs> so First Peter 2.17 is honor all people. Come on. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. They go to fear again. Fear God. Honor the king. Where is the honor in the church today? Hmm. Um, and it goes back to fear. It goes back into what what I just said. You know, we we've lost reverence for the sacred things of God. First of all, the Bible says honor all men. Let's let's, let's start there. Yes. Everybody is valuable. Come on. All right. Everybody's valuable. And this is why we should seek to uh, reconcile relationships. Everything that we've been talking about today, it all ties together. Yes. It all ties together. Because, see, when you're offended with your brother and you don't reconcile with your brother and your sister, mm-hmm. and you go on and on and on, and you don't handle them right, that's dishonor. Mm-hmm. That's dishonor. Honor all men. Properly assess the value of a person, you know, and treat them accordingly. That's what honor is. 
So every at the basic level, honor all men. Okay. And and and, and then you know, uh um um you know, we, we have to honor um read read that scripture one more time. Read that scripture. Honor all people, love the honor brotherhood, people. love the brotherhood, God, honor, God. The king. honor the king. Okay. So 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 you know, I just I, I just covered the brotherhood. You know, fear God. We cover the fear of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then honor the king. Anybody that's in authority. Anybody that's in authority. Be subject to higher powers. Yes. You know, uh, uh, because all powers that be are of God. Every power that exists that is of God, from the pastor to the police officer. Okay. Is all, is all from God. Yes. Okay. What we have in the church yes. is an authority problem. That's why we can't honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And see, we confuse respect with authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, we, we 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 confuse respect with honor. Yes, yes. Okay, because you respect a person for what they do, you honor a person for who they are. Mm -hmm. Notice when somebody mess up, or so you, you know, I done lost all respect for him. Mm -hmm. That's what we say, because we respect is when you treat people according to what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you do right, we treat you right. If you do wrong, we do you wrong, mm -hmm. or we abandon you, or whatever the case may be. But when it comes to honor, honor is based upon a position of who you are. Yes. Okay. Like even the office of the president, I have to honor that, mm -hmm. whether I agree with them or not. <laughs> okay. And those who know me know I'm vocal. I don't yeah. agree. <laughs> All right. But if he shows up at my house, I still have to salute him. Mm -hmm. I still have to honor him. I still have to treat him right, regardless you know, of whether I despise his policy no. or not, mm -hmm. because he's the president. You understand? See, we don't understand that in the church today. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what the reason why David ran from Saul was not because he was scared of Saul. Wow. He won't scared of Saul. He won't scared of no man. Wow. Okay, this man, this man killed Goliath cut his head off and paraded his head around. Okay? He won't scare to no man. He can't, he slew the lion and the bear protecting his father's sheep. He won't scare of a man. But he left and he fled because he understood mm -hmm. honor. I did not want to have to be in a position where I be forced to defend myself mm -hmm. and put my hands on the Lord's anointed. Yes. Mm. yes. So I'm just going to leave and run for my life. David understood honor and authority. That's why he ran. Because he recognized that even though the spirit of God left Saul personally, the anointing was still on his public office. Mm -hmm. That's why he called him the Lord's anointing. Now, now see, it, it takes maturity to understand this and to implement this and to and, and to agree with it. Because a lot of people don't agree with it. Why, but, but see, the anointing is on the office. Why do you think that even if a man or woman of God make a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. They make a mistake. And you go on this whole smear campaign, right? You go on a whole smear campaign. But guess what? Then people say, hey, I'm sorry. And guess what? They still go up, 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 and you still bitter and disgruntled. Mm, mm, mm. God has an honor system. You understand? He has an honor system. So, 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 so when it comes to honor, you got to understand God don't judge how we judge. Mm. And guess what? Saul was wrong, and God took him down in His own time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> My God, we think because somebody's wrong. Right or wrong, we have the power to decide their judgment or their fate. Mm. Let the powers that be handle that. You ain't the powers that be. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> I want to touch on that honor piece because it, it deals with establishing a culture of honor. Um, people yes. need to, uh, we have to develop how to honor one another how to honor leadership, because a lot of people don't know, you mm -hmm. know, if they did not come, they weren't raised in church. Um, if they don't come from that type of background, they may not have that understanding, but 
for those of you that are watching that are senior leaders, you start this with your leadership team and then your leadership team is then as they are in their respective places, they're continuing to use their influence to spread the culture of honor throughout your church or your ministry. That's very, very important. Because when people are new and they don't, you know, know who to look to, they might just be coming into the Lord or just be coming into the church. They're going to look to these power players for what the culture is. If you're an elder or if you're in a position, some people, oh, I'm just here to serve. If you are in a position, you've been placed in a position, people are going to look to you to determine what to do or how to act, what's okay, what's not okay. And they may never even open their mouth and ask you a question. They're looking at your actions. They're looking at your conduct. They're looking at what's coming out of your mouth to get a picture. So for many people, it first goes back to just simply defining the culture of your ministry, because there are a lot of churches and ministers, you know, we cover other leaders, we counsel with other leaders. There are a lot of people who just have not even defined the culture of their ministry first. Come on. And now after that comes implementing honor within to that culture. Your culture of your ministry is something that is not written on. I'm not talking about your mission statement. Well, we believe we're supposed to spread the, the gospel. No, your culture is something that is not written or spoken. It's understood based on what people encounter and interact in your church. Mm. So you have to infuse honor within the culture of your ministry. Mm -hmm. So if I was to walk into your church, I don't know you. I don't know anybody there. And I was just to sit in the back and not say anything and observe. Whatever I observe, that gives me the culture of your ministry. Mm. So pastors, you may want to call a friend. You may want to call a relative. Hey, do me a favor. Come to my church, sit in the back, say hi, but don't say anything. It's give me an honest assessment of what you see. When you really want the culture of your church to be aligned with God so your church will grow, that is what you do. Because you need to know what somebody who don't really know anything really sees and experiences. Mm. That will let you know what your weak spots are and, and where you need to grow in some things or shift and adjust some things. But I want to read this scripture. Um, this is in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Now, this scripture always tickles me because I tell people, this says let the elders who rule well be worthy of double honor. That means the ones that's doing all right, they still <laughs> worthy of at least some kind of double honor. <laughs> they, they, they might not be well, but they don't need double honor. They just need a regular portion of honor. <laughs> we cannot. Honor is something that is attached to the seat it is. It comes with status authority. Status authority means you may not like uh, uh, Pastor Watermelon, but he is the pastor. So there's a certain amount of honor that's due to Pastor Watermelon, regardless of how you personally feel about him, Come because on. of the seat of being the senior pastor mm -hmm. or the pastor in that ministry. You honor because it's a biblical principle. It is something that we should do. It's not based on the person. If you remove your honor from the person because they said something you don't like or they did something that you didn't like, they put somebody in position you didn't like, you never really honored them. Oh. You were operating off respect, but labeling it honor. Come on. Yes, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a, <laughs> I am full, y'all. I am full. <laughs> <laughs> my god this is why we need discipleship in the church yes yeah. yes this is why we need discipleship yes definitely i agree mm. oh, i always got some stories so um it goes with our discussion on honor mm -hmm. so before i got my doctorate i was you know um people would call me minister mm -hmm. Tamara. but when i got my doctorate it's like they were still calling me minister and i'm like wait a minute Mm -hmm. wait a minute now because <laughs> you know I've got this education I is you know come on and mm -hmm. it's like well I, yeah I know you got your doctor but I, I know you as minister I want to continue to call you call you minister mm -hmm. it's like their leader would do the same thing oh minister I'm like and I had to pull him aside I said look okay no disrespect but it's Dr. Tamara mm -hmm. and once he started calling me Dr. Tamara yes. they saw suit Yes. Yeah. And that's biblical mm -hmm. because the Bible talks about how Moses placed some of his honor on Joshua. 
when you want to shift the culture of a ministry, it has to come through the set leadership. Come on. You know, and this is why we tell some of these intercessors out there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for a move of God in my church. Pray for God to deal with your pastor about his will, because if it don't come through him, it's not going to last. And it's actually going to blossom in a rebellion, but I, don't, I digress. It has to come through that set leader. So in leaders that are listening and that are watching this, if you have somebody that's recently been ordained or affirmed, elevated, however you go about it, there needs to be a point where you bring them up in front of everybody and say, okay, y'all, so-and-so been processed, so-and-so ha has been approved, so-and-so was not elevated to the office of what pastor or elder, so-and-so has now been commissioned as doctor, so-and-so, they've gone through whatever type of schooling or training or education. So from this point forward, we're now going to address so-and-so as such. Now, I want everybody to stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray over them and believe God to strengthen them for the task that you have. This is how you properly transition somebody and maintain a culture of honor. But there are some pastors who don't want to do that, either because they just don't know how. Maybe they're afraid somebody's going to get upset. But like I said earlier, you cannot make decisions as a leader and keep everybody happy. I know in our ministry... We ain't going to let you dishonor us, and we're not going to let you dishonor those who we have honored. Wow. We don't, you know, we don't play them kind of games. You mm -hmm. know, some people say, well, well, it's not about titles. It's not about titles. No, 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 no. It's about, it, it is about a measure, it's about the measure of honor that has been bestowed by said leadership. Amen. You know, when, 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 when uh, people come in, and, they, and, and, and everybody knows me as an apostle. You know, everybody know me as an apostle at the very least. Mm -hmm. You don't got the, you know, you, you know, my, the, the apostles I cover call me chief apostle. That's who I am. But guess what? Uh, I'm, I'm fine with apostle. I'm not, and I'm not everybody's apostle. But you come in and you come into our assembly, you start calling me Lionel. Mm -hmm. I know you got an honor problem. Come in. Hey, brother. Hey, brother Lionel, how you doing? Mm -mm. Just, you know, no. you know, I, I, I'm just like, uh, that's not that's not how we do things here mm -hmm. and you, you, know, you know in our ministry one of our adjectives is to get a hold to you and correct you mm -hmm. um but but you know i i, I know people don't understand honor mm -hmm. you know um now now don't get me wrong black church black church but we can go overboard <laughs> okay we, we 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 the grand chief master supervisor superintendent grand <laughs> poobah apostle so and so you know that's a little too much, all right. Um, but um, I I, th I think it's disrespectful. I'm the type of person. Even if I don't believe you're called to be such, if that's what you call yourself, I'm going to call you that. That's right. Out of honor. So if you call yourself bishop, and I know you're an apostle, hey bishop, how you doing? You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you call yourself prophet, and you don't do the, and, and you don't got a prophetic bone in your body, and you've been affirmed as that. God bless you, Prophet. <laughs> now, now if you ain't if, if you ain't been uh, 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 if proper authority ain't bestowed it upon you, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But if you went through the proper channels to have whatever title you got, mm -hmm. whether I believe you get you you got it or not, I'm just gonna call you that. And mm -hmm. if I have a problem, if, if I'm deeply disturbed in my spirit to mm -hmm. keep from dishonoring you, I might keep my distance. We got a lot of perpetrators out here. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay, that was good. Mm. So, um, are we good on time? Does anyone need to drop off? Because we got like three more that we need to. I, I may have to drop off shortly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we may have to drop this off is shortly. Too good. Well. Yeah. We got to come back. Yeah, yeah, we, we got to come back. back. Okay, cool. So, do you want to stop now? We'll just come back. Um, yes, we can do that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, okay. we can we can do that. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to thank you all for coming on. Um, I believe someone already put the iCam link in here. I know you guys have a, a podcast as well. I just want I, what I usually do at the end. Mm -hmm. Give every speaker a chance to just uh, let our the listeners know that everybody that was watching was, uh, where they can find you at. And just anything that you want to uh, leave them with. Amen. 
Okay. Amen. Well, first, we want to say thank you to you for yes, bringing us you. on. It's such thank an you. honor and a privilege. We don't take it lightly yes. for you to bring us on your platform and to give us the opportunity to share. So we want to say thank you to you as well. Um, thank you to the other ministers that have been on here with us. I know the other minister had to go, but we appreciate you all. Yes. It's definitely been an honor dialoguing with Man. you all and really bringing solutions and conversation yes. to the body that is much needed. But yes, yeah, somebody did drop the link there. So for those of you that are watching, you can join us on our online service on Fridays. You can join us over on YouTube as well on our F3 podcast, Faith, Family, and Finance. We have new episodes every Tuesday and Saturday and no topic is off limits. So if you join our podcast, we're going to talk about some church stuff. We're going to talk about getting your money right. We're going to talk about your family, how to handle your kids, but it's going to be some other things we're going to bring up there too, because we believe every every topic deserves a conversation amen 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 apostle i didn't want i don't know if you had anything to say i didn't want to jump ahead of you. <laughs> oh no no no! i'm good <laughs> you said you just said enough <laughs> i'm good i'm good amen. i'm thinking about this chicken about the grill <laughs> these chicken wings about the grill yes. balance amen. balance balance <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, I too want to thank you, Dr. Tamara, for this platform yeah. and, and, you know, and sharing it with us um, and, you know, and inviting me and, and um, Apostle, um, Apostle, I want to thank y'all. I mean, I have learned so much on wow. this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I am just so Amen. full. I'm mm -hmm. so blessed to have been on this platform today. And so I just want to thank y'all for just, for just, you know, your teaching, Amen. your teaching. And you know, and, and we do uh, as as a church, we need to get back to the basic. I think we mm -hmm. do need to get back to Amen. the basic. So I'm um, like again, I, I'm just so so blessed for everything that has happened on today. I I don't know about anybody who's been watching, but I have learned a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, some things that I want to do differently as well. And so I thank you for that, and um, and I'm praying that I'm praying for Tamika. That she just do what yes. God has called her to do Amen. and not sit Amen. on it. So, you know, she's still on my mind that she goes and do what God has called her to do. Anybody else who's out there and they feel something inside rumbling, they feel Come God on. moving on the inside. Go ahead and, and take a leap of Come faith. On. Ah, yes. take a leap of faith. God has mm. you. He has you. He's just waiting on you to go. So I just um, pray for each and every person who who who's trying to get to that purpose, who's trying to walk in that purpose, who's trying to do what God is calling them to do. Um, take it from me. God got you. He got you. Once you take that step, he got you. And so you won't be alone. And again, I just thank each and every one of you for all that has happened on tonight. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank everybody that was watching us and asking your questions and um, just, just taking out of time, you know, cause people don't take time out, um, you know, for things, especially yeah. when it comes to the church. Yeah. So I appreciate y'all being out here for, with us for what, two, almost two and a half hours. Um, thank you. You know, and it's always, um, you know, me, I'm always like, if we just reach one person, mm. you know, we've done our part. Um, I want to thank the apostles again. I want to thank uh, minister, uh, Christopher. I want to thank minister Shaniki. Um, we will come back with a part two. We have to check out everyone's schedules, but we'll be back. Um, but the upcoming Amen. things um, with uh, Kingdom Gales Ministries, we have another conversation with the apostles. Uh, I believe it's next week, Sunday, July 3rd. Yes. We're we'll talking about church hurt versus church trauma. Mm -hmm. Okay. So y'all want to come back for that? Yes. Be good. Yeah, that's going to be real good. Yeah. And then after that, I believe it's July 16th. I got to check the dates. I believe it's the 16th. We're coming back for a Let's Talk Prayer. Mm, man. That is with um, um, Miss Barbara Brown. And then I have another speaker is Tahira. Oh, Tahira, I'm sorry. I always uh, I forgot your, your last name, but I'm going to get the fly together. So, uh, Amen. <laughs> I'm going to get it together. Um, but I, I, I'm just thankful for everybody coming out here. And um, the goal is always to talk Jesus, always preach Jesus. We want people to live right. Yes. Right. Okay. Do right. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all again. 
Um, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to stop this for this evening and we'll be back again. Share the replay. Come back. There's so many nuggets that mm, yes. are on today. So come back, get what you need and share it with others. Okay. Uh, so enjoy the rest of your evening. Until Amen. next time, be blessed. Amen. Amen. Bye. 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 God bless you.